Today on the Time Out Coaching Podcast, we have one of the rising stars of British coaching. He has established one of the top academies in the UK, which has successes not just on the national level, but also in Europe. He has produced numerous players who now play at the NCAA Division I level and the professional levels as well. I'm pleased to welcome coach Neil Hopkins. Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Um, obviously, I just want to just preface uh, the podcast to the start of the podcast by saying that, um, you know, you were a really trusted and valuable assistant to, you know, certainly some of my biggest successes when we were together at Mersey Tigers. And um, obviously, I've been involved with some of the stuff uh, that you've done, you know, at least on the outside looking in at uh, Myerskov. So that at least gives a uh, context to, uh, to our, to our talk that I know a little bit more about you than, than some of our viewers would did uh, it today. Yeah. I think this is, what is it? 10 or 11 years in the making um, from me making sure that you had a, had a coffee and you're sorted before games to uh, <laughs> now, now here we are. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you know, let's talk firstly, um, you know, in a quite a quick way about, you know, your introduction to basketball, um, you know, where, where was that love of the game and, and, and did you start seeing some early, early, you know, from an early period of time about, you know, the, the, your involvement in coaching? Yeah, I think like, well, firstly, obviously the, the backstory is, and I think I'm maybe the second, uh, this is my second conversation, I think for the Time Out podcast. Um, I think I was the, 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 well, was the first one. I didn't actually know that that was going to be a podcast at the time. So now I know that um, with you, I, obviously we can uh, have our conversation, take it in a different direction. So a lot of the backstory is actually on that first one in terms of how I first got into basketball. I think really, you know, it was from being, it, my, my story is probably a little bit different to some of the guys that you've had on recently. And obviously, you know, I'm, I'm uh, humble to be in their presence um you know the likes of laszlo and lewis and the guys that you've had on recently have been you know awesome conversations um i started playing late and you know as as i had a you know on the on a hoops Fix podcast as well you know i wasn't ever uh, someone that was going to pursue the game to an elite level as a player because that wasn't really an opportunity that was afforded to me and i didn't know the game you know in that sense you know the, the background that i came from in terms of you know, geographically, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't that culture. And, you know, I was basically a product of my environment. But one thing that I've always been is like an avid sports person and, and I've played sport across, you know, a, do, a lot of different levels, come from a sporting family, um, you know, or, I've always, you know, been competitive and done as much sport as I possibly can. And I, I think basketball was the sport actually, you know, in my youth, in my, you know, when I was younger, the, the one that I gravitated to, you know, and, and fell in love with at an early age. So actually, you know, from a, from a playing perspective, you know, I've always played and tried to be active with the sport. Um, but from a coaching perspective, and I know that obviously that is a, you know, the, the remit of this, of the podcast. Um, I, my first real introduction into coaching um, was I, I didn't foresee myself progressing as a basketball player and I wanted to do something else within the sport. And I also wanted to, you know, get away and get university experience. So I moved to the University of Central Lancashire um, to study a degree in sports coaching. And in doing so, um, I was always very proactive in terms of trying to, you know, work and earn a bit of money and this, that and the other. And, you know, then I started coaching the community-based stuff. And I think from that point on, really, you know, I was kind of hooked. I think you're going to ask about some of my earlier, uh, you know, influences with regards to, you know, how I did get into coaching. Well, Yes, through my parents and stuff like that, but also, um, you know, Laszlo, I mean, I will give some credit to someone like Laszlo Nemeth, who was actually delivering one of the modules on the degree that I was teaching, and uh, oh, sorry, the degree that I was um, on, and he was someone whose passion and enthusiasm came across in the lectures that didn't come across typically from other lecturers. And, you know, you could see that his lived experience was something, you know, that was, was unbelievable. And that was inspiring at that point. Um, another, another kind of how it all fell into place, I guess, is upon graduate. Well, actually, when I was at university throughout that whole process, you know, through the ages of 18, 19, 20, 21, um, you know, I was the captain of the, the university team and in doing so I was trying to lead sessions and trying to put extra things on I think that was something that you know I, I really hung my hat on early was always trying to go the extra mile and 
this was whilst you know coaching at the local community club and stuff as well do you think just on a, a side issue um do you think that if you had stayed in that worcester type area that where you were born and raised and, uh, and brought up in do you think that if you hadn't gone to the northwest which had a quite a vibrant basketball scene that that you could have had taken a different path i don't know it's a really good question um because you, you you had a lot of basketball going on in Northwest, like you had said, you know, you know, community stuff, and you 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 you've often referenced about playing in in the local leagues, and then you had you know the Magic and the Giants, and there were academies going. There was all kinds of stuff that was going on. Yeah, I I I don't I think that my route was going to go. I think I was going to go into basketball no matter where I was. And I did actually look, you know, at my university choice, I was looking at like UEL and London and places like that as well. And at that point, it wasn't, um, I wasn't consciously thinking I'm going to go into coaching. I, that wasn't, uh, you know, something that was consciously going to happen. But but also, <clears throat> I think by definition as to who I am, I'm, I'm someone that, um, you know, if someone asks me to do something, I'll go and do it for them. And, you know, I'll, I'll try and, you know, <laughs> almost a little bit of a servant in that sense. And, you know, especially during, you know, the early years and that age. And you know, I take a lot of that from my, my dad. My, my dad is someone that, you know, he, he does so much, so much stuff for, uh, you know, he's actually within field hockey. He does, a, you know, a hell of a lot of stuff. And I've, I struggled, I guess, to say, uh, no, no, I won't do that. And I think when people started to realize that I hadn't, you know, uh, a passion for basketball, it was quite easy to ask me to come and do something. And I think had I been in Worcester, London, wherever, then I probably would have found that route and that pathway, you know, anyway. I just think that what I hear, you know, at the point of moving up here and graduating from university and progressing to Runshaw, which was the first place, mm. I just think that I had a blank canvas and I had a couple of people. Um, you know, when I was at Runshaw, there was a, a guy called Roger Lee, who was, um, he, you know, one of the senior lecturers there. <clears throat> and he, he, was an, he enabled me. Um, so, you know, when we if I had an idea to go abroad <clears throat> to, to, you know, if we had a tournament to go to, for instance, he was like, yeah, I'll drive the bus, you know, however we need to make it happen will happen. And I think from that point onwards, it was just like, you know, well, you know, you become solution based, you become someone that's ambitious and hungry for it, especially if someone enables you. I think if you're in a different situation where the barriers get keep put, you know, get put up, especially at a young age, you might be someone that just gets used to, well, I can't get through that. Or you know, was so, there, was there, um, before we start talking about the run short, because, you know, that was basically your first kind of, you know, proper, you know, structured stop. But was there a, a light bulb moment um, where you, you know, not so much whether you were doing, say, community coaching or you were taking the university team, but you realized that you, you one, love doing this or two, that you actually, hey, you were really, you were really good at it. No, not not really. No, I, I think at the point when I was still with the university, and you know, obviously I'm you know work with these guys now. We you know the guys that I was at that you know, the likes of Nick McCarthy and you know the guy that works with us now called Dave Collister. Like the group of our university team, we're still quite close. And I think actually it wasn't necessarily a light bulb towards coaching. It was competitiveness. Mm. It was you know I, I I've always been someone that's super competitive. Um, you know. Uh, probably overly so in some in some certain, certain situations and you know we we had some success through the university team but actually I was competitive and I wanted to make the team better so we would be better and it wasn't a, it wasn't necessarily about coaching it was more about us trying at that point to win I didn't correlate the two you know I didn't put them together it was more about like, let's win let's win let's win and I think what I think that, that was something that my the coach at the time a guy called Craig Wright probably saw and he saw that my you know, basketball mind, I guess, was developing and I was starting to apply what I was, you know, picking up in the classroom that, you know, a couple of principal lectures in particular that really helped, you know, in terms of they were inspiring. Brian Jones is another one at, you know, at the University of Central Lancashire as well. Those those were the guys that I was like, you know, you know they had lived experience. You could see that they'd gone through the grind mm -hmm. and that was something that I found like, you know, that was really of interest. Uh, you know, and off the back of the university, Craig, um, you know, recommended there was a there was a position that came up at Runshaw to take their academy, and I gr just graduated, and they said, you know, this is this is here. It was, you know, there was some general players there and stuff. And he said, do you want to, you know, do you want to go and take it? And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, and that was kind of where it all started. And and then 
from I guess your, you know, I don't want to jump too far in, but having someone that wanted to enable me early, you know, I think I was very fortunate with that, you know, I, and then from that, I, you know, from, from that point onwards, I think that's actually shaped who I am. Um, so, you know, I'm, people, uh, I have, you know, if we're going to a senior management meeting or whatever, they def- describe me as a rogue. Um, you know, I'm someone that will probably do something first and then figure out the, if there's a problem, figure out, <laughs> figure that out after. Um, so yeah, that was how it got into it. And I think that's a key thing now for, you know, young coaches is finding someone that will enable you to, you know, if you have an idea that will let you run with it, you know, if you you know want to pursue something that will let you try it, because that's how you learn, you know, about failure. That's how you learn what works. Um, you know, and, and I was very fortunate to have people that did that. Before we get on to the to Runshaw, and I do want to talk about Runshaw in a, in, a, in, a, in you know some detail, but um, do you 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 could potentially be the first guest that um, actually went through some formalized you know coach education process? Although um, you know Coach Laszlo Nemeth you know did do the you know studied um, physical education as well, and there are you know even Coach Dunning um, you know so, uh, uh, did that as well. But there were very very few sports coaching degree or courses type courses do you think that that has helped you at least understand that there is some theory behind just you know uh, practice practical basketball coaching experience or you feel that that's helped you um so that your mind is open to a lot of different ideas and and exploring different things yeah, hundred percent. And I, when I started university in two thousand and five, I think it was, um, I, that University of Central Lancashire was one, of, you know, the first to deliver the sports coaching suite. And um, although I didn't feel there was like there wasn't loads of coaching delivery in practice, you know, it wasn't like you were on the floor delivering, delivering, delivering. It, it was more about the, you know, the the coaching process and you know dealing with, um, you know, how people learn and you know how you would. Um, structure sessions and you know putting some some context behind kind of your practice and I think really that's you know hugely important and it's something that I've pursued and continued to go with you know I I graduated with that degree and then I did my teaching qualification and then um, you know I've recently done a level five in leadership management you know my master's as well in, in high performance coaching and you know it's something that I've continued to really go with um, and I do think it's really important and the, the thing is, it's it, what, what it enabled me to do early subliminally, I think, was have some structure to my coaching, um, you know, and start to consider some of the things that are really important within coaching that isn't just the delivery. So, for instance, you know, the management of personalities, okay, or, you know, the management of expectation. I was doing it subliminally, um, you know, equal opportunities, it might be something like that, subconscious or conscious bias, you know, bits and pieces that you would naturally do as a young coach it might even be a case that you have a, as a young coach you have a parent challenge you well actually you know for a coaching education coach education or basketball coach education which is typically tactical technical you know there's there's not there wasn't much psychology back then but how do you deal with that parent that's coming mm-hmm. to you to challenge you because at that point you were trying to win and you didn't put your son on you know I, I wouldn't go through that I wouldn't do that now but um, you know all those things I think were bottled up within the degree and those are things that I've you know applied straight away um yeah it's it's just it's a case of linking did it quite well early on would you so just to summarize then um are you would you say that uh for any young coach now that is looking to get into high level performance coaching in, in basketball whether it's uh, academy level whether it's you know professional game would you say that 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 your advice would be that they to, to take an academic route would would really help them um, or would you say that that just happened to be something that really helped you and um, it's kind of horses for courses yeah it really helped me um, I do believe that um, you have to have a balance and I do believe that as you progress, you know, within, you know, your coaching career, that it is important to have some form of context behind what you're doing. I think that is the biggest thing that typically a lot of coaches will, will, uh, you know, will do a lot of stuff. 
and there might not be context behind it, whether that's a, you know an academic context or they might not really understand or be able to put a concept behind what they're actually delivering. I think that's what sometimes that's the bridge that can be gapped, you know, and um, I think that for me is the most important thing. You know, when, when for instance, when we're doing, and, it, and actually at a younger age, you don't appreciate it as much as you do when you get a little bit older and you have mm. some lived experience. So when I did, uh, you know, the master's, it was more a case of something conceptually was presented to, to us. It might have been about philosophy or, you know, it might have been about, you know, pressure, building pressure or whatever it may be. And you think, oh, you know, I, I do that and I, I do it in this way. And, but, I, but I've been doing it without really having the context to it. But now I understand what I'm doing. Mm. And, you know, that gives me, you know, more of a foundation to build that, you know, moving forward. So, I, you know, I get a, a good example is... Um, you know, uh, I've talked about this with a number of people before. Within your coaching practice, especially at the academy level and working with teenagers, you build up, you know, I'm trying to build up pressure within the practice, you know, and, and ultimately people talk about like the rocky road. And I think, you know, something that's probably becoming a little bit overused. Within coaching, um, you know, you see kids or players at their worst and at their best, you know, absolutely. And you automatically put yourself into, you know, or you can put yourself into a conflict situation a lot of the time. Now, what I think I started to develop through during the, the you know, especially the master's degree was how to take someone to that place and how to put the nets in place, a safety net in place to bring them back down and mm -hmm. to make sure that there wasn't, you know, especially with young people, that there wasn't anything that was, you know, everlasting uh, you know, and that we had a safety net in place to be able to bring it back down, you know, deconstruct it and say, this is why it was this, this is, you know, this is why we put it in place, uh, you know, and that was something that I didn't have before. So, you know, taking that into an example within, um, you know, at any level, I guess, if you have a player that you really want to, you know, you want to toughen up, um, you know, and, and you're going to, you know, you're going to do a few things within the practice, it might be that you're going to, you know, you're going to make up some calls and you're going to piss them off, you know, excuse my, my language, but if you're going to do that, you know, what is your strategy to get them back on side? And I think that that was something, I think that needs to be planned. And I learned throughout that process of, you know, let's mm. plan it, let's think about it through doing the, quali you know, the qualifications. So it's not, yeah, it is an element of psychology and stuff like that, but actually without putting context behind that kind of practice, which you do get from an academic course or from reading, you know, et cetera, I think those things are not as efficient as they can be so does it help you become or have a better feel for the game probably not does it help you have a better understanding as to how people work yeah for sure um you know and i think that's important so let's go and talk about the the run shore situation because um even though you've done a couple of podcasts and um you know uh, interviews and stuff um i don't think that um you've talked enough about you know uh, first of all um, how successful you were, you know, in given the resources that you had. Um, talk to me about, you know, that part of that process and um, the fact that you were on the court and playing lots of games, you know, how that was developing, you know, your, 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 your coaching philosophy and, you know, understanding the game and, and how you were going to approach it. Yeah. So uh, aside from having the enablers, um, I, I was – pretty much on a on an island from a coaching perspective and at that point when i st when i started at runshaw um i you know was just hungry eager i was doing the northwest stuff re like you know i was coaching you know every day was driving to a different school and you know just trying as much as possible to to um to get some money obviously but you know to just do everything i possibly could and um Runshaw gave me a great, great platform had a, you know, a couple of courts, I could run a court and I would drive in, do the morning stuff, individual work, we would do team-based stuff. I was on my own. So, you know, I uh, obviously was, you know, the, the god of that situation, uh, you know, and being on your own, not having anyone to, to challenge you or correct you. And it was really a case of, at that point, I wasn't, there wasn't a great amount of age difference between me and the players. And it was more a case of, you know, Neil, can you come and work us out? Can we, you know, we want to do this, we want to do that. And I was, of course, at that point, yeah, yeah, let's, you know, let's get in there and let's do it. And on the flip side to that, you know, I, I, um, you know, wanted to help these guys obviously progress and, and move forward. And, um, you know, I, I'd gone through the, the analysis modules and stuff at the university and was, you know, pretty 
clued up on, you know, video and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So automatically, and this is obviously prior to meeting you, I was doing a lot of the stuff that you would kind of want someone to do in an assistant coach's role or, you know, that I was building that kind of toolbox, you know, I was efficient with videos, well, um, you know, individual workouts and stuff. Yeah. Were you, did you feel that you were trying to compete against um, any specific academy? Um, because you, you played on the national stage. Um, I know for a fact you played on the national stage because you played us at Hackney. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if we played once or twice, but you definitely played. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, regionally there was, the th and this is where the competitiveness comes in. There was uh, Runshaw and another college in Preston called Cardinal Newman, who where Ben Eves and, uh, a few of us had come from and at that time they had a you know a good cohort of players and number one was you know they're not going to beat us and they didn't beat us and uh you know that was that kind of job done the next one was uh magic you know who were uh, obviously you know we had some rivalry anyway because a couple of our players were playing for the magic uh you know national league so there was a little bit of rivalry you know and at that point that was you know they were you know Really, they were very, very, very good. The Magic at that point, you know, Paul Middleton was doing a great job bringing through you know, the likes of Jordan Whelan and um, Lee Goldsborough and, you know, guys like that. And, you know, we got close to them, but at that point, you know, they were just a little bit too far, you know, away from us, but it was close. I think at that point as well, you had, you know, I remember having a, you know incredible game against uh, John Collins when he was at Solly Hall, um, you know, and he had Dorian Benjamin and, uh, you know, those guys as well. So, we were starting to like etch a little name for ourselves, I guess, you know, and it was quite funny because we had like seven or eight players and, mm. uh, you know, yeah. So it was really, you know, I think that's where I started to build, you know, people would turn up to our gym at Runshaw and, you know, be like kind of shocked and, you know, we would stick it to them as much as possible. And uh, we were then competing, you know, like I said, like on the national scale and that was just through, you know, really teaching these guys to be super competitive and, you know, not give an inch and, you know, they were, they were great players. And the, at the point then, um, I think that, you know, social media was starting to evolve and it's basketball still had that pureness with these kids, you know, where it was really, they were, they took pride in their home court. They took pride in, you know, representing, you know, the, the area that they were from. And that was something that was vitally important. I think that's something that's slipping away a little bit now. Um, and yeah, that was, you know, it's great. So then, I guess that brings us forward to, uh, you know, that we were playing in the, what would have then been the EABL final four. And it was uh, run short us, you know, Hackney, Milton Keynes with Connor Washington was there. Um, I'm unsure of the other team that was there at the point. Then we, we played, you know, you guys, Hackney in the, in the, in the semi-final. And um, we took you, we took, uh, that was a talented team that, that, that was there then. We took that team all the way and I think we lost by four or five points in the end, but I credit that to uh, one of our best players who took an elbow to the eye and it split his eye open. And, uh, you know, he came out with five minutes to go. I think we were up at that point, you know, about to cause the upset. And then Hackney went on to win the final against Milton Keynes by 40 points, I think it was at that point. Mm. And that was, you know, I remember them. I didn't, you know, this is again, because I was so encapsulated in my little island, in my little bubble. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I did know, I knew who you were at that point because I'd been to watch the Tigers play um, Magic at the Echo Arena in a pre-season. I think that was that year, I think. Um, and I obviously saw you sat on the side watching the, the, the Hackney game and you were with Henry Mooney, I think, at that point, you know, on that day. And then we obviously had the conversation after, and uh, you know that was kind of the rest, I guess, is history from that from from that perspective. What with regards to Runshaw, um, just purely talking purely basketball here now, um, you know, you 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 were in a a kind of unique situation. You know, there wasn't the academy structure and programs like it is now. And then secondly, um, you, you're there. You've got not unlimited court access but you know good court access were what were you what were you learning there because that must have been such a a great time not much pressure but you were able to like experiment and really develop your own basketball kind of philosophy and stuff and and how you taught the game how you taught in practices what what were you learning there what were the things that you really took from I, there 
I think it was, that was, um, when I first came in, it was all, it, it was, um, you know, what have I done before as a player? And, you know, what can I put on the floor and how can I evolve this? As I was there for those years, I started to coach the regional stuff. So at that point, when I was coaching, you know, the under 17s, you know, I was the APC head coach. And I was starting to then be instilled with some of this, you know, BE player pathway stuff. And, um, you know, that I was taking bits of that and evolving it and trying to use it as much as possible. But also at that point, it was almost like a five out craze. And so I was, you know, I had a small team and it was more about, you know, let's, how do we, you know, play, uh, how do we become really efficient 1v1 players out of the five out set? How do we, and I, I think back to it and I look at, you know, I go back and watch some game tape and it's very much, you know, we're still, we're looking for breakdown, we're looking to play 1v1 and we're looking to utilize five out and spacing. Now, whether or not I taught it consciously like that, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I obviously was, you know, we'd run some basic actions, you know, like to cut and replace, cut and fill, you know, whatever it may be. But actually it worked for that group of players and they were very good one-on-one -on -one players. They had a good skill set and we, and we spent a lot of time developing their skill sets as well. Um, you know, so that was, I think, more of the, you know, the, the angle that I was going on. So I started to be influenced by the, you know, the governing body stuff. But, you know, I was taking what I felt was, you know, important and relevant to that group. And then I was influenced by some of the trends of the game, but it wasn't necessarily that people were saying to me, oh, try this or do that. I was just taking what I could find and what I saw and oh, that worked where, for them. Or, where, yeah. were you, where were you seeing? Were you, were you talking to other coaches in the area? Um, you know, what, or who was, who, were you going to, you, you went to America, you, you know, you had some friends, you know, what, what, was, what was your main, main influences then? The, the, I mean, I did, I did go to America, um, but at that point still, it was, you know, it was more a fact finding mission and, you know, it wasn't, I think that we still have to go through this concept of like really being subconscious. It's sub, it's, it's all, it's these subconscious experiences that, you know, would, I, I don't, I say this, I say this to a lot of the, the, the students. So do you appreciate, you appreciate your, you know, what you are learning a lot more when you get a bit older. Mm -hmm. um, and I probably didn't appreciate it as much, but what I was doing was, so for instance, we went to America and I sat down with, um, you know, I actually had this conversation with the guys at Princeton the other day. Um, and I, I sat in the back office when Sidney Johnson had just taken the job at Princeton and I was 20, I must've been 22, maybe 21, 22, probably 22. And he put on the, the, the Princeton offense. And we, you know, at that point I was, I was, I kind of knew it. I didn't really know it. But I was that, that, you know, brave, you know, young 20 year old sat in there going, well, I, you know, I could say, I said to him, I can remember saying it because I said to the, the new assistant the other day, I said, um, you know, I, how do you concede out of this, the offense? And you know, I said, I bet you can see quite a lot in transition because I can see that, you know, there's no top coverage. You guys are not sending guys to the glass. You're not aggressive. And as I was sat there, this phone rung and it was Pete Carell on the, on the phone. And uh, he said, I'm sat here with this cheeky English guy who's questioning your uh, your offensive uh, your offensive structure and, and I was like wow. right and then cool. and then he said to me he put me on the spot he's like well, what would you do then and then, you know I'm like ah, okay so you know like talking through it and actually that year um, and this is the, the guy <laughs> the assistant said this to me the other day he said well they went to the final four that year or not to final four they went to the dance that year so uh, obviously I had a big part of that um, you know addressing their transitional defense so mm. it was more a case of I was harvesting all of these little you know I, I remember watching Samit you know at Manchester you know, he was a, uh, an advocate of five out and then he started to evolve that and drag other players into it and you know just really it was a case of just watching a lot of basketball not really understanding what I was seeing conceptually but you know just starting to pick up trends and again going back to the sportsman stuff uh, and this is something that I think is really important. If you have a feel for sport and you understand space and typically, you know, through any sport, I think that you're positioned well to be able to, you know, to, to coach and understand, you know, how, you know, sport works and, you know, almost simplify it to make it, you know, make it work for you and the players that you have. And that's, it was never a case of putting in all these crazy systems and, uh, you know, like trying to run, this and trying to run that it was more a case of right how do we get it done nice and quickly and efficiently uh how would i like to play it you know how would i you know find the spaces and the gaps and i would take a little bit from prince a little bit from five out and take a little bit from what you know what laszlo was saying oh i've watched 
um, you know, a couple of Euroleague games, I like that action, like this, like that. And it was really just a, like a mashup of, you know, of everything, um, which I think it typically, that typically happens. I would like to say that I've completely evolved from that point, but that's where it was, you know, <laughs> at then. Right. So then in this, um, this period of time, like you said, um, you know, we started to, um, you know, to get uh, closer and um, just uh, towards the end of the Runshaw process, you you became, you know, uh, you came aboard. I, am I right in saying, because my memory is as terrible as anything, um, you came at the end of the, the Everton Tigers, the second, uh, my second season, did, did you not? Yeah, or you yeah. were yeah you were involved in that process and yeah. then in then into Mersey you did that whole season. So what were some of the you know like that was obviously your first exposure to you know to professional basketball even if it was at the BBL level. Um, what what was your what was your thinking? Um, you know what what was the, what was that whole process like? Well, I want to I really want to ask you a question first. Um, <laughs> what, 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 so if going back and again like this is you know you've been through the this process with quite a few people in terms of um, you know adopting an assistant from somewhere um, you know or taking on people what is it that you saw <laughs> back then sure. when we played against runs when we played against Hackney that you felt you know, he is someone that, you know, I can invest in because I feel now that like, you know, as I'm probably going through that process now where I'm starting to look for guys that, you know, you can, I want to bring someone on board to help them, to, to mentor them. You know, what was it that you saw that? Well, I, you know, first and, first and foremost, you know, I saw, you know, your passion and um, your drive, you know, to, to, to be successful. And, you know, I, I was, you know, incredibly impressed by the fact that you had come from this small program. It's an absolute fact, you know, almost no one really knew what that name was, um, you know, run short, especially outside of the, 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 the better academies, like, you know, I guess at that time it was, you know, the East Durham's, the South Nottingham's, the, you know, Milton Keynes, like you said, and the London academies like Barking Abbey and stuff. So I was, you know, to, to come from there and to be competing and to be competing against, you know, really, um, you know, impressive athletic teams, you know, with, with what you would probably have as non, not a huge amount of athletic uh, players. I was super impressed. So I knew that you, uh, you, you had to be doing something right. Um, I saw your passion, I saw your drive and I saw, you know, the fact that you weren't scared um, and that you were, you know, you had a belief in what you were doing. So those were the, the things that impressed me, first of all. And then, you know, after that, um, you know, I, I, I keep making this point sometimes through in our podcast, but you've heard me say this many, many times, um, you know, in various group settings or, you know, as a, as a young coach, you can't be afraid to keep asking questions and you can't be afraid to um, challenge yourself by going somewhere that you're probably going to feel uncomfortable in. And you weren't, you know, you, you started talking to me, you started uh, developing a relationship and conversations and you would constantly <clears throat> ask questions. So for me, um, I just saw someone that really, really wanted to be successful in this game, wanted to get better. Um, and, and at this moment, I don't see um, as many of those younger coaches out there. I see coaches that um, believe that they have all of the answers where, you know, we know that that's not, you know, the case and or they just don't ask enough questions. So th that's my answer to you on that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's definitely, um, you know, I was proved right, you know, um, you know, I guess I was so proved right. With you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, I think that's a really, you know, and I, I look at it now and I was having this conversation with someone the other day and it's like the next cohort of coaches that's coming through, you know, like I, I feel like I sit between the lines and I'm like, you know, I'm 30, I'm 33 years old. I feel like I'm, yeah. you know, I've been in this game for a lot longer and it'd be interesting to see whether you put me as a rising star or a, you know, a legend, but <laughs> if I'm a rising star, I've been, I've been rising, <laughs> I've been rising for 10 or 11 years or whatever well, it is. And it's, it, it, go on. Just, just, just before you answer that, it's really interesting because, um, you know, 10 to 12 years ago, or certainly um, when I came back to the BBL, 
um, that's how I exactly felt. I felt that I was a, still a young, a young coach, and I was still had a lot to prove. Um, and but there was, I didn't know where that that next that that kind of legends level was, and I didn't know who was under me underneath me as well. I did feel a little bit on an island, and I know exactly how you would feel as well. Although there are a few guys that are kind of in your bracket at this, mm. moment, or I would put in your bracket at this moment. Yeah, and but I I do fear a little bit for the next group. You know, I I do agree that there's a a cohort of coaches between the age of maybe like thirty and forty. But I think actually under the age of thirty, I think that there needs to be you know there's a, it's a different generation now. You know, and it's exactly as you said. And I I think this is this is obviously with exception, but a lot of people you know do have all the answers and they're almost afraid to be challenged and I feel that's worrying you know that is worrying and I think one of the biggest things you know we're actually going to go into that journey with you a little bit now you know when I had that opportunity with you um you know obviously I grabbed it with both hands and I and I had the durability to stick it out so durability was you know um traveling from here to wherever you know I think you know that was a big that was a big deal I think the first the first experience that I had properly with you that I really do recall <laughs> was you uh, we we were struck we were playing down in Essex and we were struggling for a kit and I had to go to run short I didn't have the key and I had to climb through a hatch to get a kit out and then I had to drive a minibus with James Jones um, you know Drew Sullivan those guys down to Essex you know do everything, you know, go and find a way to wash the kit, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, and it was the durability to do those jobs and not think, and think, do you know what? This is what I need to do at this point. And, you know, after a little bit of time, that was one thing. And then the other thing that I remember is we were sat in the, I don't know, we were playing uh, Tim Lewis's The, the Leopard. Was it? No, it was um, when he was at Essex. What was the team called? The Pirates. Pirates, yeah. And at half, no, before the game, um, you know, I was stood there and you would always you know, I would, I would write in my notepad, and I'd, well, this is actually, I learned to do this. You did your, your pre-game and you said, you turned to me and you, went, you said, you covered everything, absolutely everything. <laughs> and you said, you went, Neil, is there anything that you need to say? And, uh, you know, you always give us, this because the assistants, you always give us that voice to, you know, to, to say something. I said, I think I remember, I do remember saying, um, the, rims are, the rims are really tight. So look out for long rebounds. <laughs> and, uh, and that was that was the start of it. And then, so and then you you know but those things again like you put you you know I know a lot of people you put them under that situation and go right give me an answer and you you know you like oh, I'll melt away I wouldn't know what to come up I, with. So I always used to I I haven't told this story too many times but um you know like when I was the assistant to Chris Finch, you know, on the Great Britain teams and the same goes even for when I was with Laszlo. Um, you, you know, I, there were, there were times where, you know, I'd be mad inside myself because every little thing that I had to say, they covered in their pregame meeting. So when they turned to you and said, you know, um, Tony, is there anything you, you want to add? And you're just like, you know, no, I think you've covered everything. And it used to make me mad. Um, but, but, but at the same time, you know, you realize that um, those coaches were, you know, next, you know, next level. And they were, they, they really understood what they, what the game plan was and what was, what was needed to be said. But yeah. of course, assistants are there to pick up anything that wasn't said yeah. or was, you know maybe that head coach had missed so yeah there's always I, those situations I, I went into this uh, so I evolved through that process and I would always you know my notepad obviously you do the stats and I'd always write down a couple of points and you you know after we'd go and stood we stand there and we go through the stats and we'd always hold one back could always hold one point back and I was I was hunting the uh, you know we go through it and I'd say it and I, I was always hunting when you go that's a good point Neil that's a good point. <laughs> and, I, and then I, I knew I was like, that's a good half time for me. <laughs> so yeah, but that, that, that evolution of, you know, like going back to that point about, you know, the next generation of coaches, it's like number one as a, as a head coach, you know, and I've obviously gone through this evolution. Now, are you, are you enabling the person that is, you know, committing a hell, you know, if they're committing that amount of time, you know, for, for nothing and doing all that stuff and, you know, assistant coaches in particular, they're going to be up all night clipping film and they want to impress. And, you know, they're, they're having the, obviously the relationships with the players and there's a lot of effort that goes into it. You know, just enable them with their voice, you know, allow them to put them under pressure to do it. And I think that was something that, you know, I, I picked up from you very early on. And, you know, I always appreciate that. And 
that was something I think over obviously the championship, the winning year that started to develop. And, you know, I, I felt that I started to, you know, develop pretty good chemistry with you and the other coach and staff. And then obviously that led into the second year where obviously it was a bit more challenging, but still we had a younger group and, you know, I felt that there was a different, it was a different emphasis. And, you know, I, I, I did uh, obviously learn a hell of a lot, you know, through that whole mm. process, but I know we've gone kind of a little bit wayward, but, you know, that's... Oh. Uh, uh, did you, um, how were your thoughts as a, as a young assistant, especially the first year where, you know, the players were extremely high level yet, you, you know, people like Nate Rankin, obviously Drew Sullivan, David Aliu, you know, all of these kind of like Andy Thompson, James Jones. I mean, what, what was your, what were your, how are you feeling inside, you know, when you had to make a coaching point to them, when you were, when you were doing the video session and you were having to do something on breakdown, what, what, what were you, were you, were you, were you nervous or were you starting to feel empowered? Um, how was that? How was those? I was, I was probably quite naive. Um, and just in, but this is the innocent wonder. I would give it that, you know, like, you know, you'd make a point and, you know, they've probably thought about it five times over, um, you know, but, but also that, you know, we had a great group of guys that, you know, would, they might not hear it, but they were listening. You know, so, you know, that, and that's, you know, I think that I, you know, I've had conversations with the likes of Dave now and, you know, Dave, for instance, Dave Alley, I, I think that I had enough respect within those, you know, that group and the respect wasn't necessarily from like my, my basketball, you know, knowledge and pedigree and, you know, what I'd done, but it was more from my work ethic and passion for the game and the fact that I would, you know, do anything I could to make that situation as, as good as I could. And, you know, also, you know, deflecting away from, you know, some of the pressures that you were under, which I didn't appreciate because there was stuff going on off the court. And I just turned up and did what I could from a basketball standpoint. And that was, I think, that innocent wonder was something that maybe, you know, the players would appreciate. And, um, you know, I also think as well, though, that when we started to get into the season, obviously, you know, and again, this is, uh, <laughs> we were having a lot of success. So it's easy in that situation. You know, it's easy when you're winning. And, um I think as well that in any of the rough moments, especially, you know, I remember, you know, particularly your relationship with referees in some games, you know, could get a little bit heated. And I think that I started to get on a good level with you in terms of, you know, how I would, you know, there was only, there was certain occasions where you would tear, like, you know, you'd tear, tear me to pieces or whatever, but, you know, I wouldn't, I was never, I wouldn't avoid it. I keep talking to you, keep saying stuff. You know, if you were getting into the refs, I'd be like, come get like, pull, pull you away. Like, let's leave it now. We know what's going to happen here. There was a couple of times I think where, you know, I, I would obviously be watching the game and, you know, picking out tactical things and they started to like, it started to work a little bit. And I think from that point on, there was, you know, more and more of a trust. But also I remember, and I use this term with, um, you know, I actually use this term with the guys that I had last year. That was the team of destiny, in your words. And, you know, I was part of that. And I think that everyone was locked in, ready for it, you know, from, from the top, you know, all the way down to, you know, the, the water guy, you know, everyone was locked in and ready. And it didn't, it didn't matter what was happening. We were just, you know, we were, we were, we were ready to go, go out swinging every game. Mm -hmm. And everyone was on, on the same, on the same hem sheet. So the culture of the team was awesome. All right. Um, last quick question on that situation. Um, and these are, you know, I'm putting these, point, putting these points in because they're really important for younger coaches um, that do get themselves put into these situations. But just talk to me about being an assistant um, and having to, you know, to say referee and um, be, you know, active in practices. Um, you know, you've got um, possibly one of the toughest characters to have the referee in Drew Sullivan. Um, you know, how, how, how did that, how do you approach that? And what, what's your mindset, you know, when he questions for 20 minutes in the practice, why you made that call? I think, you know, a big thing about it is understanding that, you know, particularly the likes of Drew and, you know, the guys that we had, these are ultra competitive guys, you know, that look for their marginal gains and, you know, off, you know, off a referee, for instance, that is a, you know, there's wins to be had there. But ultimately, this is, it's, it may be personal in the context of that game of basketball, but off the court, it stops. And, you know, ultimately, I think that that's something that's really important to remember. And this is, this is again, I think this is, are, are the, you know, can coaches, especially young coaches, be too cute? 
Yeah, for sure. And, you know, actually back then I didn't, like, I didn't care. Like I was not bothered about that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I would say I was quite, you know, there was an unshakable edge in that sense. And ultimately they're competitive. And I think that going back to my experience, not necessarily as being a high level player, but I, I do feel like I've got a very good sport mind. And you have to understand that, you know, you have to understand that these guys are the, the top of the, you know, the top of the tree, they're super competitive, um, you know, and you've got to be able to balance that rationally against, you know, the, you know, the personal side of it, you know, they're not going to actually going to kill you, even though they might say that in the game, and they're not actually going to do that. But, you know, that's, I think nowadays, again, you're going back to that point, and this is, you know, this is, I don't want to set you off, I don't want to set off either. I see these people come out of all these opinions and stuff on Twitter, and they get challenged, someone will ask them a question and they block it. They block that person, you know, but you can't escape the benefit of being stuck behind a computer, being a coach. Mm. You know, actually, when you're on the floor and you're having to be challenged in questions, and again, comes back to that situation I was talking about before, about what is the process to deal with that conflict? Mm. Well, I'd already kind of gone through that subliminally and, you know, you know been educated in it, but also I was thrown into it and you have to figure it out. You know, like if my default was to write, well, you know, and you see it with people particularly, but you see it more so on, you know, online now. If one of the players had decided that they were going to take, uh, you know, a problem with my coach and I was just going to block them, for instance, right, you know, you know, that isn't going to work. And then we do have a personal issue. You know, we step off the court and it isn't about competition. It's not about people wanting to know the answers and, you know, growing. It's more about, well, you did this and I did that. And, and that for me is like a, you know, a huge, I think that's a huge problem now. Our, you know, young coaches in particular, you're putting yourself in a situation where you're, you're going through conflict and you're being challenged or are we becoming, you know, too cute to that now? You know, and that's, that's, that, that is the whole concept of sport. Sport is challenging. We see people at our best and we see people at our worst and you've got to be able to deal with it both ways. So, you know, I'm, I never saw a problem with it, to be honest. Good stuff. Really good stuff. That's a great uh, segment there. Um, okay. So we go from, you know, your run shore, um, you know, lots happening, being involved in, you know, the, the Tigers. Um, that's starting to unravel a little bit towards the end. I, I, I leave to go to, to, to Germany. Um, so explain in very, very quick terms exactly how you ended up um, at Myersco and, uh, you know, talk, let's talk about, you know, the establishment, uh, the establishing that program. Well, this, the story, this is where this, this is where, um, that period when I finished with the giants, sorry, with the, with the tigers, I remember having, uh, I met with the, the then owners at Charnock Richard services who offered me the head coach's job. Um, for for Japan a month or whatever. I think I remember having this conversation with you and being like, Dad, this is just going to go one way. And, you know, we obviously didn't take it. Then I ended up, you know, obviously with the Giants, um, their second coming. So I was, you know, moved over there with Jeff. And at that point, obviously, we recruited the likes of Dave, James, you know, guys that were obviously familiar with. So there was, you know, some good, uh, you know, it, it all kind of synced up. Uh, the Runshaw thing kind of came to an end off the back of, you know, and, and you know, this is another story for a different day. Um, you know, we obviously had the, the move to Vietnam, uh, you know, where, you know, <laughs> at that point, you know, I was, I, I had three opportunities then. It was the, it was the Tigers. I had a job offer in Luxembourg to go to, a, you know, a program over there, which I never really talked to you about because I didn't take you that seriously. You know, I only ever think about it now. You know, I don't know how that could have turned out. And obviously the Vietnam one. And I think at that point, you, you know, you had suggested that, that was a good idea. And, you know, I had probably, I probably jumped into it, um, you know, being, you know, young and wanting to try something and wanting to do something a little bit different. And it was a good point in my life to do it. Obviously went over there, didn't work out. I was back very quickly. And then I was in like this limbo phase of, I was working at the, the, the Giants. Was, well, you know, I was coaching at the Giants, but I was kind of in and out of work for maybe four or five months. It was, it was, it was a really rough time, actually. It was, you know, because I, I had a mortgage and stuff at that point. I've managed to like get myself, you know, a house and I'd worked pretty hard to get my PGC and I was starting to teach. And, and then I, I, t I literally sacrificed all that to, you know, take the job over in Vietnam. And it just didn't, it didn't work. You know, it just didn't work. It wasn't where I wanted to be, you know, and I figured that out very, very quickly. And I came back and, 
you know, it took me a little bit of time to get back into a, into a position. No, actually, I was still with you then. That, that's my fault because I was still with you because I remember receiving a call about Myasco within a practice. So I'd gone, come back. That was in the, the second year to, to Vietnam. Gone, come back. I was still with you at Tigers. I must, I apologize. And then I received, a, I went to the job, a, a, a teacher's role, a, a 0.5 teacher's role at Myasco. And I got the job and kind of that's where it started. So for a year and a half, I was teaching. What, like the first year, first six months, I was I was teaching purely, you know, part time, just delivering lectures. The the second full year became the head of sport. I was the, the program leader for sport and exercise science, and in the over that course of that year, I was setting or putting in the in motion, you know, the, the stuff for the, the basketball program. That my first full year was the year yeah. that I moved to the Giants, and then yeah, that then the third year, the you know what would have been the third full years when. My scope, that's when we started the academy with 25 players. <clears throat> Absolutely, um, that's, yeah. the, that's the correct kind of timeline because yeah. I remember being in Germany and um, writing yeah. that stuff for you there. Um, I mean, the first and foremost, from my perspective, um, I remember you, you know, telling me about this, this place, um, Myasco, and I was like, yeah, whatever. Um, again, yeah. another no, no name, uh, agricultural college. And I was just like, you know, what the hell? And you were like, no, 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 this is completely different. You gotta, you gotta come, you know, it's this incredible, you know, they've got all these, uh, sports academies. And so I, I think you, I think you told me, to, uh, I think I came, and, you know, the moment I arrived, regardless of the lack of the basketball facility, um, I, I thought you could be a dynasty. You know, I, you know, I didn't say in those words, but I thought you could be, you know, the best academy in the country. And the simple fact was that you had the, the accommodation and uh, the ability to bring, you know, kids in, in a true academy process. And that's no disrespect to, you know, Barking Abbey or Charnwood or any of the other really good academies in our, in our country at this moment, but you have this, you know, had this unique situation. And I remember saying to you that, um, you know, if you can just get this going and you get it on the straight and narrow, you know, you're going to be unstoppable. Um, so just talk to me about, first the process um do you think that the fact that you knew about running an academy from runshaw you knew all of the things that you know that you didn't need to do wrong and that you could do right you know helped you with that process yeah yeah definitely and then like absolutely you know that that experience was something that i lent, you know lent on but also the the biggest thing in me was i always said when i was at runshaw i said if we had accommodation you know, imagine what we could do. If I could do this with eight kids, imagine what we could do if I had accommodation. And then I was put in this situation where we did have accommodation and, I, you know, I was obviously rubbing my hands together at that point going, you know, like now I've got to work, you know, and, I, and this is, this is what, I, you know, I've got to work, got to work, got to work. And um, obviously we, you know, I worked really, really hard to, to put, you know, the staff and infrastructure in place. We recruited 24 kids in our first year. So automatically the college had that, you know, that buy-in. Um, you know, and, and that was kind of set us running, you know, that was, that was it. So, you know, that, that it cuts a really, a really long story, very, very short, but ultimately people, you know, people ask me, you know, how do, how do you, you know, how did you get it sorted and get it done? You know, and, and I do believe that, you know, there's two ways in which you can do this. You obviously, you know, you land on your feet and you have the accommodation situation or you start to build like, you know, this, you know, great club infrastructure and you're able to pull players through from that. But we, um, yeah, we, you know, we really got, you know, obviously we had a lot of success very, uh, you know, very quickly from that process. Mm. So now, you know, talk to me about um, just, you know, you, did you start changing your whole basketball philosophy? The fact that, you know, you've got the, the ability to, you know, practice almost two times a day. You've got, really the ability to at least get some recruits in i mean it wasn't going to be easy you had a you know blank canvas you but you also had to recruit um you know you weren't going to get the best kids to start with you know because you had to prove something so um talk you know talk about that and you know what style of basketball did was there a style of basketball that you were going to try to play and and talk about how that led to you know your first national championship successes 
I think that at that point, having come from the professional game, my systems and structure was built a lot around the pro, like, you know, pro sets and quick hitters. And, you know, maybe that wasn't the best way of teaching kids, but that was, you know, what I was very much used to at that point. Um, you know, and I think that I'd gone through that evolution of the five out stuff to seeing the success that you can run with almost like A to B, B to C sets. Um, you know, and that was what we started to put in. So not only that, but, you know, obviously having been in junior basketball for a while, I started to figure out exactly where you could get scores from and how you could do it. And then, you know, obviously the ability to recruit in a few better level players helped that situation. But then whatever, you know, the other thing that started to happen was I was held accountable by the staff that we started to bring in. So we had a, you know, a really good amount of staff, obviously, you know, that you were there in terms of, you know, just giving some advice and, uh, you know, overseeing some of the mentorship stuff. And from that point, you know, the philosophy, I guess, started to evolve. And, you know, I think we were always people, this is, this is where the evolution comes from. You know, initially it was all, it was all about let's play up tempo. Let's do this. You know, now I understand what tempo is a little bit more, but back then it was playing up tempo, you know, it was let's press, let's score, let's, you know, play really, you know, and engage in an active game and then we'll run pro sets and we'll run guys off this and we'll run guys out, you know, and we'll look like a professional team. That was, you know, where it was first year. We, you know, we made the um, elite eight of the, the, the EABL um, with a, a team that pretty much it was my Northwest guys. Um, mm. And at that point as well, some of those guys were going over and playing for the, you know, for the Giants and were in the practice with the Giants. And that's where I was as well. So I was kind of split between the two. And then the second year was the first year where we really, you know, we not so much, we did recruit, you know, we had, you know, some, some two Irish players, you know, a Bulgarian and, um, you know, we, we did have a good group together, you know, some of the best players that obviously we've had through the program. And that was the year that we, you know, we, that we won the national title and still it was based on, you know, the pro sets. Um, it was based on the, you know, a lot of the professional element of basketball that I'd picked up from, you know, you guys or the Tigers and the Giants. So, um, so you win your, your first national championship. I mean, what, what changed after that? Um, you know, do, 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 was the process of, uh, you know, expectation now was really high. Um, you were getting different levels of players. You would get, you know, for the first time, I guess, instead of you having to convince um, people to come to you, you know, people wanted to come to Myosco. You know, it was yeah. the, a destination. Uh, what, what, explain a little bit about that. Yeah, that, that made a, you know, that did make a big difference. And that's, you know, I know we were talking a little, you know, and, and the questions that noted on recruitment, the recruitment did shift because we did have more people showing more of an interest and it became a lot easier, especially the higher level players. You know, I was, I was coaching with England then as well in that crossover summer and a few of the guys, just, you know, joined us, you know, off the back of that. Um, Carl Carey was one of them. Um, so, yeah, it, it did change. And obviously, you know, I, what I always said, the hard, one of the hardest things within coaching is, you know, winning. But then a more, even harder thing is winning again. Uh, you know, that the year after the national final, we went back to national final and we lost. Um, you know, and that was really, you know, I think we went undefeated for 18 months. We didn't lose a game for 18 months within the academy structure. Um, you know, back-to-back -back finals without, we lost in the February and then we went, whole year to the next March, I think it was, something like that. So it was a long period. And at that point, it was, you know, we had a swagger and probably an arrogance that, um, you know, that now is, I, I, you know, we chipped away at a little bit and there's a bit more substance behind kind of what we're delivering. So it was a case that we were recruiting talent and the talent was winning us games. And, you know, that for me, at that point was enough because that's what I understand it, I understood it for. But then, you know, as we moved into these latter years, it's, that's, you know, the, it's more about developing the talent, you know, and the, and the winning will come, you know, not the other way around. So, yeah. I, I want to ask you a big question about that because um, you've been a huge advocate in um, promoting your players in your academy, um, you know, to get them to to the next level in America, um, and to give them that opportunity of, of performing on in in in, in that environment. Um, you you weren't the first to you know produce these little videos and to work really hard on social media and to really really develop contacts, but you definitely you know right there at the forefront. Um, so is that mindset um one of the first points that you want you want to 
continuously get your players to play at the highest level so they have the next opportunity um, and then the winning will come on top of that or is it uh, kind of a split what what do you what's your philosophy in your mind about that now yeah I mean it's, that's a it's a great question um, and this is where the balance needs to happen because to win at the so what is what is basketball ultimately about you know for a guy that progresses well someone wants to recruit a winner you know you need to be ready to win and i think coming from a winning program helps because they understand the pressures that come with that you know not only just winning but like i said before winning again and the you know the, but then the the issue that you have is is when you start to progress up the levels winning looks different so, for instance, with junior players, you know, you will naturally start to hit ceilings. You know, some of them, you know, that their ceiling might be that it's Division Three, and at this point, you know, they can't progress further than that. But actually, that isn't sufficient for someone who wants to go and play Division One NCAA, for instance. So you've got to be able to provide an opportunity for them. But then, I had this, you know, we played obviously last night, and uh, I, you know, I said to the guys, we played against Derby, you know, top of Division One, and I said to them. You know, this now when a pressure, this is a privileged situation that we're playing under the pressure of this game. But the pressure of this game is not what you think it might be in terms of this equal opportunity mantra. So, you know, now the cream is going to start to rise to the to the top, you know, and you see it like great Osibor, for instance, last night, you know, he has a great game and it's no coincidence that he's going to Division One with Montana State and, you know, a former player of yours, Chris Haslam next year, like that's where he's destined to be. But some of the guys that pitch themselves at that level, mm. you know, I want to play them, but realistically, you know, that's not, you know, it's not an applicable level for them. So that's where I have to manage that expectation of, you know, like this isn't an equal opportunity sport. If we're going to start thinking about winning at the next level, which is what last night was about, we have to think about the rotation. We have to think about how that fits in. And that's about the educational package that you would then put in place for the players. So, you know, you're managing maybe the communication saying, look, this, the matchups don't work for you. You know, your skill set doesn't translate to this game. You know, you're making basic junior level passes in a senior level game or, you know, whatever it may be, which is what happened with certain players. Now, it's not to say they didn't get an opportunity, but their opportunity is for me in that situation isn't in that game their opportunity is earned through their practices and you know and, and that's you know that's an evolution that you know i think we've definitely gone on with you know the, the level being started to be pitched higher and higher and higher what we have been fortunate in doing in the last few years is particularly with the european stuff is we have gone with we've had a deep squad you know and, and typically i will rotate through 10 to 12 players most, most games because that's the level that they're at and I actually take the team that we had last year every one of those guys has either had an opportunity or, or is in a better situation now than they were last year I think from that cohort of players we'll end up with four Division 1 players from that group last year so that was the level that that team was at but obviously you know it's always about managing you know those expectations of the players versus the reality of winning and losing and ultimately when you are sending a player to the next level they have to be built to win. And, you know, I think that's something that we've, you know, we've really worked hard on, on doing over the last few years. Just very quickly before we talk about the EYBL, um, let's talk about um, a typical week of Myosco. So um, let's say for argument's sake that you, you know, obviously Wednesday is a normal day for academy games um, and you also have National League games. So talk to me about a typical practice week um, starting kind of from Monday. We typically practice twice a day, every day. Um, so on a, on a Monday, for instance, you know, that's that's combination of S&C as well. So they have strength and conditioning every day um, uh, alongside the team practice. Uh, so on a Monday, for instance, they'll have a team practice. We usually go quite hard on a Monday, uh, followed by a strength and conditioning session. Tuesday, um, they have shoot around in the morning. They have individual reps, shoot around small, small group uh, reps early in the morning. Team practice in the afternoon, strength and conditioning after that. And again, we go hard on a Tuesday, even if it is a game on a Wednesday, because, um, you know, typically the games are not overly competitive. You know, that's, you know, within the, the EABL. Um, so we can afford to go hard. Then Thursday, um, we usually have like a, almost like a prep practice for the weekend. You know, we, well, they have, a, sorry, they have Tuesday morning, they have a session as well. Tuesday afternoon practice and S&C. Friday morning is when we will do our scout walkthrough, you know, anything that we need to get in place for the weekend on a Saturday. Saturday game, 
or Sunday game, and then one of those two days off, Saturday or Sunday. So, you know, it's pretty full on, full time, you know, like it's a lot of delivery, um, you know. So, yeah, it's as full time as we could possibly make it, I think. And then the guys get access to the court in their own time as well to, you know, for extra reps. That's one of the benefits of having your own court pretty much is they can get in there and shoot. And, you know, we're really fortunate with, you know, our staff are just, you know, unbelievable and obviously well, the benefit that we have is we have six staff within our program and typically someone's available to go and, you know, shoot or rep or, you know, work individually or jump in the S&C suite with them or, you know, and, I mean, obviously you've been there with s and suites attached to our office pretty much and the court's attached to our office. That's our haven. And, you know, the guys get access to that really as and when, um, you know, obviously providers and member of staff available for them. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty full on. Right. Now, you, um, from, you know, pretty much from the start of the Myosco process, um, you always emphasized about um, trying to get, a, you know, additional competition, whether it was um, playing in National League or more importantly, you were always trying to expose the players to European competition. So you started doing that by going uh, to tournaments and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it culminated in, you know, joining EYBL and, and obviously last year, you know, with the incredible achievements. So, you know, kind of explain that process so to explain that, you know, what, what was your philosophy with, with that, pardon me, and also, more importantly, um, explain what EYBL has done for the Myerscope program. So we, uh, and I want to take this down a little bit of a coaching route as well, because this, there was a, a significant event in my life that changed my uh, whole coaching mantra. And, you know, that, and this is, you know, I know we haven't, we haven't dived into this too much, but, you know, on the whole concept of philosophy, and, you know, I want to just kind of go into there to start with. My philosophy has evolved from, you know, yes, you could say stuff like up-tempo, you know, hard work, this, 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 this. When I did my master's initially, we deconstructed this philosophy and we took it back to, you know, what are the actual internal drivers that you have within you that you, you know, that you work upon. And obviously philosophy is overarching, but what underpins the philosophy for me is um you know my what happens internally what i value my beliefs and um, you know yeah and and my you know my beliefs are based around accountability and you know measurability in particular and you know that's something that i could dive into massively but you know that's another hour okay. so um what happened was i went through that process and then my i was this is where everything changed for me in terms of coaching and who I am as a, as a person, I don't believe that and this is, you know, going back to that first point, I don't believe that you can be, this is my opinion. You can be an, uh, a standout leader of people or coach teacher, someone like that. If you don't truly understand who you are. And the reason why I say that is because how do I instill a mindset or a mantra on someone if I can't follow something consistently, you yeah. know, in terms of like, you know, how, how I behave, my behaviors, you know, how I react, um, you know, what I am, you know, what makes me tick, what makes me understand, you know, everything. And, and I, I, and this is, how do you understand that for instance? Well, my breakthrough moment came, I, I actually believe that you understand that in almost your darkest moments. And, you know, that happened for me, it was, uh, you know, a bittersweet moment, obviously, which, which I'm going to go into now, uh, you know, my, the birth of my son. So, I mean, obviously, no, you know, this story and, you know, um, you know, not to go into it too personally, but, you know, I, I was sat, sat in a bar in Phoenix at the final four and my partner went to premature, you know, labor and I was 10,000 miles away with, you know, my son en route at 28 weeks. Um, you know, and then I had to get home and, you know, that process of like 72 hours, which, you know, she was in labor for, and, you know, my, my little boy, fortunately, obviously he's, you know, he's in really good health and he's, he's, you know, he's absolutely spot on, but that 72 hours was some of the, the darkest moments of my, uh, you know, like, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know, you know, what, what is going to happen here? You know, you were, your worst fears, you're thinking your worst, you know, you're, everything is then rationalized as to who you are, what you are, what you're doing. You know, you're at that point where there's 
nothing more important than that. And I'm sure every, you know, people listening would have been at a moment where it's, you know, you're really under inc- huge internal pressure. You don't know what's going on. You're p- worried, panicked, you know, you know, I, and I had, the, I had, for instance, I had a 10 hour blackout window where I was flying, where I didn't know what's happening. Um, you know, and that gave me the ultimate level for, you know, how I react in those situations, who I am, and it gave me complete perspective on on life, <laughs> you know. And it might like it might be a, for some of us that might seem like an insignificant event, but for me that was you know that was pretty pretty big. And you know it could have gone obviously a lot worse than it did, but I didn't know that how, I didn't know the outcome. So that then was in my head, and that then started to shape this evolution of my philosophy and mantra based on values, beliefs. Um, you know, doing things for the right reason, um, you know, and that kind of took me into this. This is why I bring it into the EYBL. This then took me into this new phase of, you know, who I kind of who I am. So, you know, the EYBL at that point, I wasn't challenged as a basketball coach in the United Kingdom anymore. You know, I'd, I'd won everything and that's not to be arrogant. You know, I'd, we'd done it and I didn't I didn't want to keep doing that. You know, I wanted to do something else and the EYBL presented itself with an opportunity for me to learn, stretch, develop, you know, hold myself accountable to my values, um, you know, for me to have ambition within, you know, within our circuit, I feel that we hit a glass ceiling very quickly as British coaches. And, you know, that was my opportunity to grow. And, you know, I did it from my perspective. I wanted to do that for me, for my coaching staff, and ultimately, having gone through the grind with GB programs and, you know, seeing how inefficient some of our players can be despite their athletic abilities. I wanted to establish a brand of basketball within Europe that was born in England or in the United Kingdom. And that was the, the opportunity that was provided to us was the, was the EYBL. So there's probably a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that was the, that whole process was the evolution of, of Neil Hopkins, I guess. <laughs> And then, you know, obviously you went, you know, two years ago, um, you know, the, the, well, the first season you went in there, what were some of the um, lessons that you learned, you know, in that? And then how did you rectify those lessons to become even more successful the year after? The primary lesson was don't try and beat the Europeans playing their style of basketball <laughs> Interesting. because it won't work. Um, so it was, you know, you go in there and, you, you know, we play in Zalgiris and teams like that. And obviously they're running multiple actions. Uh, you know, they're running, you know, swinging the ball right to left, left to right, you know, inside, outside, multiple passes. It's all textbook. And, you know, you're trying to emulate some of that stuff because that's how you feel that you should play. But, you know, it doesn't utilize the strengths that we have as a nation. And, you know, that, that didn't work. And we evolved that pretty quickly. In our first year, we went into the league with... Um, we built our stuff again. We used the pro sets. We used some, we pretty much based all of our offensive system out of the shuffles, you know, out of shuffle sets. Um, and yeah, we got some good stuff out of it. And we, you know, we did really well, actually. We got to the final four, but I didn't think it was going to be enough to win. The second year, the way we evolved our game, um, the British style, how is it effective in Europe? Well, you know, you've got to maximize kind of what these players are, and that's great athletes. We have length, we, you know, we have size through positions, you know, we are able to, you know, we are able to press, but I think sometimes there's a difference between, you know, these European players, you're not taking the ball off them 1v1, you're, you know, you're influencing passing lanes, getting on catch really quickly, um, you know, and, and that's the stuff that we started to emphasize from a, you know, defensive standpoint. We just got really, you know, we had our rotations, we were always active, we emphasized, you know, crashing second efforts, winning, you know, scoring out of transitional points, you know, really getting the easy ones. Um, you know, something I said to our bigs is like, how can you get 10 points easy? Well, if you run the floor twice for two laps, that's, that's a couple of points. If you get sure. on that, you know, that's four points there. If you get on the offensive glass for a couple of putbacks, that's another four points. And if you get to the line for two, there's your 10 points right there. Mm. And, um, you know, stuff like that, just simplifying it was, you know, really important. And then we changed our offensive system. We took out all of our sets. Uh, we didn't run any sets. We were principle-based. And, you know, like we principle based and we based our offense on cross matchups, uh, attacking cross matchups, because that's where our, our strength is in Europe and pitching and, and hitting open men, engaging two or three other defenders within the possession and finding an open guy 
re-attacking, playing 1v1, um, you know, but with obviously with a lot of structure um, in terms of like what our triggers are, what our, you know, our basic actions are, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that worked. Um, for, you know, and, that worked for us. And, de and defensively, um, what were you doing most of the time? Were you, were you switching a lot of those, you know, act those multiple actions? Were you, um, how were you guarding the, you know, all of those step up ball screens? What were you doing there? We, so typically against the better teams um we would run a combination of defenses in possession so for instance we would extend we would extend some form of press run them down to like 16 seconds and allow them to get into their set from 16 seconds and typically when because their because their alignments offensively are quite predictable for instance out of third screen in step up screen in you know middle third screen because it's quite predictable and you can see how it's going to develop we would typically jump zones um you know when they got to about 20 seconds and then they didn't have the players to play breakdown they you know that that's not how they play they generate for each other they don't generate mm -hmm. typically for themselves and you know that really really threw teams um particularly like Zalgiris. i mean we beat them twice come you know once was uh, you know comfortable but that was their you know their junior euroleague team and you know those guys have gone on to you know, their point guards now arizona and you know he was next level guard and you know those those tactics really just you know they just couldn't break it down and then we were generating turnovers you know and we're getting out and running and then we're doing it again so yeah, that was that was kind of typically our movement, but that again, that comes back down to you know it, it was I'm I was <laughs> this is where the feel comes back was the right picking the right points to switch your defense. So you know, as a coach, you're analyzing the alignment of the defense. You're analyzing, for instance, has your big come up to cover the, the middle third ball screen quick enough? If he hasn't, let's just quickly zip it into zone. You know, when at what point are they going to start to set the middle third screens? At what point are they going to step up? And it, it, I think, you know, if you ask, um, you know, our coaches stuff, those are the times where I've probably been most engaged in, mm. you know, you know. How, and are you? Are you um, with the switching um, from the man into zone in the middle of the play? Is that uh, a call from you as the coach, or is that a call from the players? That that those situations are called from me. Right. Yeah, that was a coaching call, and and the reason for that being, we agreed that you know, and that was that was I you know for time out, you know, particularly when we do that stuff, I'm, I'm I've asked them, they listen for it. Um, you know, that's the only time I want them to focus. If they don't hear it, they're focusing one-on-one. -on -one. So what I don't want them to do is, you know, at that age, particularly, this is the biggest, the, the, and, and again, this is one of my, um, you know, huge observations from European basketball. Players are able typically to focus on, you know, defensive possession or possession in general. But what they do struggle to do, British players, when you take them out there, is they struggle to concentrate on a specific action. Mm -hmm. And, you know, concentration is a, is a narrowing of focus. So, yeah, they're engaged, they're focusing, but their ability to concentrate on the finer details of a possession is something they struggle with. So that was an area that, you know, I kind of took a little bit more ownership of. You know, that was, I, I didn't, they wouldn't have the experience to know what action was going to come. And I think as we get, you know, that was where the trust was inbuilt and instilled as well. And I wouldn't expect them actually in that situation to do that at that age. I think as you go up the, you know, the ladder, you would maybe ask one or two players to take care of that. And that's something that we put within our practice. You know, I, I have practices where we emphasize, you know, one player is to, you know, for instance, there's another thing for like junior coaches to, you know, maybe use is I ask the big, one big is in control of the other big. Mm. Okay, so that's what you're looking for. The point guard must release early. He is then in control of the spacing. If spacing goes wrong, it's on the point guard. So mm. for instance, if you're in a practice and you want to start putting a trigger in, that player is in control of the trigger, but they need to know what their actual trigger and alignment is and they have to have the voice to do it as well so that's something we started to put into our practices you know quite a lot and just to give them that level of accountability which comes back to my mantra and philosophy of you know that's you know you have to be accountable for what you're calling and what you're doing um, and that's a one way of instilling that within your practice nice now we could uh talk forever on eybl um but we we need to move this on just a little bit more um now talking a little bit about um you know as a young up-and-coming coach 
um, you know, in, in British basketball. What's your thoughts on, you know, on, on coaching, the coaching fraternity? You know, I know that you've um, been pretty active, especially since lockdown, on trying to um, generate, um, you know, uh, group sessions and bring in different types of coaches to talk to coaches. What, what's, your, what's your thought process on, on, our, on our coaching fraternity at this present time? It's a great question. And uh, I listen to every answer on this. And I think one answer that maybe hasn't been given is let's take this coaching fraternity and let's think about how many of those people are paid or are professional strictly against coaching. So, you know, I was just doing uh, the rounds in my mind the other day. and I'm, I'm not getting past 10. <laughs> mm. I'm, not, I'm not getting past 10 people. So what, what would stop the fraternity from engaging with each other more and more and more? Well, the fact that all of us are so busy, you know, like I'm marking later, I've got to go and do this, I've got to go teach. I know that a lot of people are in this, you know, this situation. And actually the time becomes, you know, the coaching time that you have is typically focused on delivery. Oh. And all of the areas in which, you know, we had this time in lockdown, and look what happened. It erupted. You know, you've got, mm. you've got this group here and you've got this group here and you've got people in synergy and linking up. You know, we don't, where is the time as a profession to really engage? You know, we have obviously conversations, but it's ad hoc. It's not formal. You know, where is the time? And so, so I go so back to the... So you're on. saying so you're saying that you know typically you've actually been to a final four and to a convention um, you 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 see you know how those guys you know pretty much all of the division 1 assistants or head coaches are in one place at one time um, or they're all recruiting a certain amount of certain players so they again the assistants are there they might be there to recruit a player they might be there to watch a game but they're sitting there and they're yeah. discussing basketball philosophy um, because that's their job and that's, that's what you're job. saying is missing is that yeah. is that correct yeah. Yeah, like, you know, I speak to, you know, other coaches that are in my situation with the academies and, you know, these are the American coaches will be calling you about a player at, you know, X time, you know, seven, eight at night. And at that point, I'm just like, I've gone through the, I, you know, I've just put the three-year-old to bed. I've done, you know, worked a long day and, you know, I've got marking or whatever it may be to do. And it's like, where, where is the time? So, you know, again, how does the fraternity grow without professionalizing? This is something that I talked about with, you know, with Sam, um, you know, on the hoop six one, you know, where, how do we, how do we gain more time for people that, you know, are so busy balancing so many different things. And mm. this is probably where it falls down. You know, how, how that's, that for me is critical. Um, you know, and this isn't this, you've, you've seen it within the lockdown. You, the, the fraternity is there, you know, like, people are there you know and and i will say as well having actually had a lot of conversations with american coaches over the course of the summer the fraternity is there and also the ex the, the the up here you know conceptually as in terms of the level of coach and the level of you know person you know we got some we got some good coaches. Yeah, oh, I was, yeah. I was, I was shocked at the at the, some of that mid to low level Division One le per games that I've actually seen, and uh, yeah. you know, I believe that we've got guys that are coaching at, at just as good a level uh, than yeah. those teams, and uh, and we're super resourceful, but we're also you know spinning a hundred plates. You know, it's it's the the running joke, I guess, with British basketball coaching. If you want to become a great basketball coach, you got to be good at cleaning toilets. You know, you got to be <laughs> like it's, you know, where's you? Know, those are the things that you have to, you know, you have to be able to, you know, all the little things, and you have to be able to manage them. And I just, I would love there to be more time, you know, and and I, I think that that is something that people do need to set aside, but also you need to balance that realistically against the the the, the money that you need to earn to live and the time that you need to give back to your families and you know yourself. And um, you know, aside from the relationships that we have, and obviously we speak you know, quite regularly. Um, but we, we, and we have, you know, we go for a coffee and stuff like that, but actually outside of this, you know, the bubble, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and it's something, you know, I, I wish would, we would have more time for, um, you know, and I wish there was a way to give back more, um, but we just don't have the time you now, which is really difficult. Interesting. Um, end of game questions for, four quick questions. Um, fr favorite drill. Um, so, uh, the coaching staff that I work with would be, uh, 
you know, they, they don't know what's coming next. I, I put in a good drill the other day, which was uh, an, an evolution of some of the get back stuff that Don Showalter works with. Mm. Um, it's a by, transitional. By, by, by the way, that's a Nick Nurse drill, by the way, as well. Um, there you go. Uh, Nick, yeah. Nick, Nick ran that from, I mean, most of the Derby players would be able to say for almost, you know, 20 years. So that's a, yeah. a, and I believe he still runs it in Toronto from what I've heard. So yeah, yeah that's an interesting one. Go on, fire away. So, yeah. so my adaptation of it is that we will start with, um, we'll send two guys, far free fun extended who are on offense. We have a um, guy put the ball off the backboard he would then pitch ahead to the opposite two with transitional defense coming back. It's something that I would need to I will video it, clip it, and send it to you. Um, and then the two offensive players will always start in the opposite side of the court. So they have to, and you put your, you can put a third defender at any point in the court, wherever you want to get your coverage from. So the, the get back drill has kind of evolved into this. Uh, you know, I will definitely need to show it and clip yeah, it and, awesome. and send it to you. Um, but it's multiple effort. It's really quick. You can run it with six, seven guys. Um, you know, it's a lot of repetition. And, you know, even if from a conditioning standpoint as well. And what we start to do is put in rules on shooters. And, you know, we will, you know, say that one person shooter. So you've got to cover him, you know, a certain way in transition, rim running, you know, drag screen. You can start to build your action. You run it off one side or off the other side. Um, you know, so it's one of those drills that kind of evolves, but what I really need to do is I would need to demo it or film <laughs> it and give it you, um, because it's okay. quite difficult to explain. <laughs> awesome. And that's what uh, I met. That's what I pulled up the other day. So, yeah. Great. Uh, favorite all time basketball coach. Um, and, and like, it's, I, I'm not, it's not an X and O reason. Um, obviously Tony, I'd have to include you in the, in the top two in that, you know, <laughs> I'm sure if I did it, you'll be able to talk about that after. Um, but, um, I Phil Jackson and it's the reason being is I, if people have an opportunity, look up his concept on tribal leadership. Um, you know, and I, I just liked his philosophical, outlook and it wasn't it was his player management you know and I, I also as well when I went through a spell of um you know transition I guess in terms of my knowledge of basketball I read his autobiographies and you know I I, under, I like this the whole concept of the Star Wars and you know the managing of personality and the way he instilled this tribal culture with them and you know I just that was just something that really I, I really enjoyed Nothing to do with the triangle offense or anything like that. Just his management of players and his, you know, his interpersonal skills. I think you know was, was something that I, you know, I really, really like. Interesting. Um, favorite player to coach? Again, that's a really unfort. You know, it's not fair. Um, bad to take this question out, but favorite player to coach? Um, <laughs> this so I could do this. I could break this into three sections, um, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go kind of. I'm not going to go predictably and go for the academy guys um, because they're all my favorite. Well, actually, I will give a shout out to one guy, which is Bradley Caboza, um, just because, you know, I, I was t telling James Jones just last night, like his competitive, when you look in his, in his eye, like you could see the, the depths of hell in terms of competitiveness. And, you know, I just love that. Um, but, but Rob Marsden, um, when we're at the wow. Giants, because, you know, he, I, I just felt that I could give something to him from a from a as an assistant and you know he would take it and and run with it and actually you know i didn't appreciate that really as much as i do now and it was in passing with a conversation i had with bob martin who said well i had a conversation with rob and you know and this isn't you know re reactive to rob but he was like bob said that you really had a great impact on him and you know that means that actually invalidating my effort and work with him awesome. and you know he might he might not have, like you know it was a year but i really enjoyed working with rob that's great. Great stuff. And then lastly, uh, your favorite um, go-to saying or statement that you say all the time? The, the, the players would probably say, uh, I would say, what are you doing <laughs> a lot, but um, <laughs> in a certain accent. Um, however, the, the big thing for me at, at this point is master the moment. Um, you know, I, I nice. think particularly with these, with young players, you know, Let's uh, let's master what we're doing right now before we start thinking ahead, you know. And, and I think that a lot of people nowadays, you know, tend to be a year ahead in their minds, or you know, have that illusion of grandeur and stuff like that. When really, you know, you need to take care of business, you know, in that moment. And that, you know, I, I think that's critically important. 
Coach, um, it's been a pleasure. There's been so many really interesting things that we've talked about. And um, I know that really this is going to be a great one for the younger coaches who, you know, should be and are looking up at you and what you've achieved in your program. And I, I know it can only go up from here. Um, so I really appreciate you being on the Time Out podcast. Well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Tony.